Chapter 10 Defenses Section 474 The most important of the grounds of defense to a bill for infringement is the well-established rule of equity, that the protection of the court will not be extended to a person whose case is not founded in truth. That appears to have been first made use of as a ground of defense to a bill for an injunction to restrain the alleged violation of a right to use a trademark in Hogg v. Kirby. The objection there taken was that the complainant, claiming the protection of the court for the title page of his magazine, which professed to be by William Granger, Esquire, was in fact guilty of an imposition on the public, it being shown that the name of the alleged author was fictitious. The excuse offered was that it was a custom of the trade, but Lord Eldon states in his judgment that he felt considerable difficulty on the question, and that this custom, though it might be very usual, appeared to him very much like a fraud on the public. His lordship, however, deciding the cause upon other grounds, left this question as an ingredient in an action for damages. In Partridge v. Menck, the complainant claimed the exclusive right to impose upon the public matches made by himself as those manufactured by one Golsh, and although the court decided the cause upon the ground of dissimilarity of the labels, a strong opinion was expressed against his right to recover, on the ground of his attempted deception. So, also, in Samuel v. Berger, where the plaintiffs asked the court to aid them in passing off upon the public watches made by them, as those made by another person, from whom they had purchased authority to use his name. Section 475. The manufacturer of a quack medicine is not entitled to invoke the intervention of a court of equity, for it is not the office of chancery to intervene, by its summary process, in controversies connected with the title to such a matter, non nostrum tantus compania, and an injunction will be refused against the vendor of a patent medicine at the suit of his brother quack, who complained that his label and envelope of certificates had been imitated, for the special action of chancery cannot be involved in a controversy which has so little merit to commend it on either side. Section 476 The court said, in Smith v. Woodruff, that the justice and morality of this defense were not very high in that instance, yet the rule must be followed if the case were brought within its application, that it is a defense that ought to be suggested by the court in some cases, and probably would be in all cases where the imposition is flagrant. For instance, where a quack compounds noxious and dangerous drugs, hurtful to the human constitution, and advertises them as a safe and sure remedy for disease, or where some charlatan avails himself of the prejudice, superstition, or ignorance of some portion of the public, to palm off a worthless article, even when not injurious, the case falls beneath the dignity of a court of justice to lend its aid for the redress of such a party, who has been interfered with by the imitations of another quack or charlatan. Section 477. The case of the Leather Company v. The American Leather Co. Com OL in the House of Lords, in 1865, furnishes instruction upon more than one point, and it is well worthy of the expenditure of time in its perusal in regard to the question of truth in representations. Section 478. The appellants and the respondents were rival joint stock companies engaged in the manufacture of leather cloth. The plaintiffs are an English company, formed in 1857, with limited liability, for the purpose of making and selling an article called leather cloth. They bought the business of an American company, which was formed for the purpose of carrying on this manufacture in New Jersey in the United States, and at West Ham, in the county of Essex, in England. The name of the company was the Crockett International Leather Cloth Company. The original inventors and manufacturers of this article, called Leather Cloth, were a firm of Crockett and Co. in the United States, who, upon the formation of the international company, ceased to carry on a separate business, and became shareholders in that company, but have resumed business, and are manufacturers of leather cloth in the United States. The international company by its agents obtained, in the month of January, 1856 an English patent for tanning the leather cloth, and having done so, they devised an elaborate label, to be attached to the goods manufactured by them, which, being in a circular form, had its circumference formed by the words Crockett International Leather Cloth Company, Newark, with the initials N, J, U, S, A, meaning New Jersey, United States of America, and also the words West Ham, Essex, 
England, these words and letters form the periphery or outer rim of the label. Within the circle, at the top, is the word Excelsior, below which is an eagle with expanded wings, and beneath the eagle are printed these words, Crockett and C.O. S. and leather cloth, patented Jan. 24, 1856, J. R. and C. P. Crockett, manufacturers. The International Leather Cloth Company carried on business as leather cloth manufacturers, both in the United States and in England, until May, 1857. They used the stamp or label which has been described, as a trademark, affixing it to the goods which they manufactured. In May, 1857, the Plaintiff S. Company was incorporated, and the International Company sold and assigned to the plaintiffs the business carried on by them at West Ham together with the English letters patent, with full power and authority to use all and singular the trademarks that had been used by the international company in their business in England. From the time of this sale, the plaintiffs have carried on, at West Ham, the manufacture of leather cloth, according to the process originally introduced by Crockett and Company, semicolon and they have constantly used the trademark which has been described stamping it on their goods of the first quality. In August, 1861, the defendants were incorporated for the purpose of carrying on the manufacture and sale of leather cloth, and they have used as a trademark, on goods made by them of the first quality, a stamp or label which certainly appears to have been formed upon the model of the plaintiff's trademark. They do not, however, make use of the word patented, nor do they call their leather cloth damned. All these facts appear in the opinion of the Lord Chancellor on appeal to him from Vice Chancellor Sir W. P. Wood. The Lord Chancellor said, to continue the old style of a firm is a very different thing from making false representations with respect to a vendable commodity, in order to give it greater value, and to create a greater demand for it in the market. The plaintiffs impose upon the public by selling goods which are, in reality, manufactured by themselves at West Ham as being the goods of the Crockett International Leather Cloth Company, and as having been manufactured by Messrs. Crockett, who were the original inventors and manufacturers, and further, they describe their untanned goods as being tanned and protected by the patent, which was not yet expired. Their request is to be protected, and therefore justified, in continuing to make these untrue statements to the public, in order to secure a monopoly for their commodity. There is a homely phrase, long current in this court that a plaintiff must come into equity with clean hands. That is not so with the present plaintiffs, whose case is condemned by the principles to which they appeal. He thereupon, without hesitation, reversed the decision of the Vice-Chancellor, and dismissed the bill, but, in disapprobation of the conduct of the defendants, he did so without costs. Section 479 In Perry v. Truefit, the plaintiff filed his bill alleging that the name or designation of medicated Mexican balm had become of great value to him as a trademark, and prayed an injunction and account. According to his own statement, the plaintiff used a printed show card, in which he represented the article in question in the following terms, medicated Mexican balm, for restoring, nourishing, strengthening, and beautifying the hair. Perry, 12 and 13 Burlington Arcade, London. It is a highly concentrated extract from vegetable balsamic productions, of that interesting but little known country, Mexico, and possesses mild astringent properties, which give tone to weak and impoverished hair, and impart a glossy appearance to the naturally dull and harsh. Where there is a tendency to fall off, the Mexican balm exerts its astringent qualities, and gradually, but infallibly, braces the pores of the cuticle and arrests the deterioration of the most beautiful ornament of the human frame, dash a fine head of hair. This admirable composition is made from an original recipe of the learned J. F. von Blumenbach, and recently presented to the proprietor by a very near relation of that illustrious physiologist. The fact appeared that one Lethart had invented the preparation, and sold the recipe for making it to the plaintiff. The master of the rolls did not think it a favorable case for the interposition of the court, there not being the least evidence that the composition was formed of vegetable balsamic productions from Mexico. Yet, as it was a case of some doubt, he let the matter stand over, 
with liberty to the plaintiff to bring in action. Section 480 The circumstances in Pidding v. How were less dubious, the plaintiff, in his labels and advertisements, intimated that the tea sold by him as Hauke's mixture, was made by Haugner, in Canton, and was purchased from him and imported into England by the plaintiff, in the packages in which it was sold, that the tea which gave it its peculiar flavor was very rare and high priced, even in China, and was grown in but one province of that country, viz, Qiangnan, and that it could not be procured in England at any price. On behalf of the defendants, affidavits were made by persons, some of whom had been acquainted with Haukwa. They stated that the mixed tea sold by the plaintiff was neither made nor used by Haukwa, that it was composed of scented orange pico, which gave it its peculiar flavor, and of other black teas of the ordinary kinds. That orange pico was not considered, in China, to be one of the best teas, and that that sort of tea had been imported and sold in England for several years, and was generally imported and sold by persons in the tea trade that no black tea was produced in the province aforesaid, and that the plaintiff purchased and mixed his teas in England. The vice-chancellor said, that on the part of the plaintiff there had been such a degree of representation which he took to be false, that, in his opinion, a court ought not to interfere to protect him, until he had established his title at law. As between the plaintiff and the defendant, the course pursued by the latter had not been a proper one, he having imitated the plaintiff's marks, but that it is a clear rule, laid down by courts of equity, not to extend protection to persons whose case is not founded on truth. And, said the vice-chancellor, as the plaintiff in this case has thought fit to mix up that which may be true with that which is false, in introducing his tea to the public, my opinion is, that unless he establish his title at law, the court cannot interfere on his behalf. He accordingly dissolved the injunction, with liberty to the plaintiff to bring an action reserving the question of costs. In Dixon Crucible Company v. Guggenheim, the defendant made a point that the wrapper of the plaintiffs averred a falsehood in stating that the article sold by them is prepared from pure carburet of iron. The court replied that no intention to mislead appeared, that, at best, it is a question of science, that plumbago is undoubtedly the proper name of the article, though it was long known to science as carburet of iron and that it was entirely too nice a question to be decided upon a motion for a special injunction. Another point was made, that the label states that the plaintiff's article is prepared by Joseph Dixon and Co., whereas the bill avers that it is prepared and sold by a corporation, viz., the Joseph Dixon Crucible Company. The court said that that difference is not of such a character as to destroy the plaintiff's right to equitable relief, there being nothing to indicate any attempt at deception or imposition the corporation being the successor of the individuals. Section 481 In Palmer v. Harris, in the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, in 1869, where an injunction had been refused below by reason of the plaintiff's false representation, the plaintiff claimed immunity from the strictness of the rule, because the falsehoods were in a foreign language, presumed not to be understood. The bill alleged that the plaintiff was a tobacco merchant in New York and made superior cigars, known as the Golden Crown, which he sold in large quantities, that in 1858 he devised a trademark, to wit, a Golden Crown, and had labels with it mark lithographed and printed, which, for his protection, he entered on the 18th of December, 1858, in the office of the District Court of the Southern District of New York, in conformity with the Act of Congress respecting copyrights and that from that time this trademark had been used by him, and became identified with the Golden Crown cigars. The labels were used by placing a larger one inside of the cover of the cigar box, and a smaller one over the edge of the box where the cover is opened. The defendant, who is a printer, made a great number of counterfeit labels of the plaintiff's trademark for persons unknown to the plaintiff, for the purpose of inducing purchasers to believe that they marked the Golden Crown cigars. Upon being notified, the defendant refused to discontinue the printing and sale of the counterfeit labels. The answer of the defendant admitted most of the allegations of the bill, but averred as follows, It is true, as matter of fact, and I aver it to be so, that complainant's cigars are manufactured and sold in the city of New York, and not at Havana, and that, therefore, the announcement upon complainant's label, Exhibit A, in the words following, 
Fabrica de Tabacos de las Medes Vegas, de la Vuel Turbo, called de Lagua, number 75, Habana, is wholly untrue, and both calculated and intended to deceive, and being so calculated and intended, is not entitled to the aid of a court of equity for its protection. Section 482. The genuine labels in this case were parallelograms, nearly square, on the smaller was inscribed golden crown, below which was LP, and below that Habana. The larger was enclosed in an ornamental border, on it were golden crown, below that the figure of a golden crown, then the Spanish words above quoted, and below all, and outside of the border, in very small letters, int. According to Act of Congress, A. D. 1858, by Lauren Palmer, in the CLKS office in DTCT of the S. DT of N. Y. There was also a government revenue stamp on the box. The counterfeit was of the larger label, and was very similar to it, but wanting the certificate of the entry of the copyright. The appellant the plaintiff below, made a point that the taking out of the copyright, and declaring that fact on the label, neutralized the words in Spanish, also, that the internal revenue stamp stated the kind, quantity, and district were manufactured, and that the assertions were innocent in their effect on the public, and that the court should not canvass the motive. Section 483. The court, by Shaswood, J., said, among other things, the party who attempts to deceive the public by the use of a trademark, which contains on its face a falsehood as to the place where his goods are manufactured, in order to have the benefit of the reputation which such goods have acquired in the market, is guilty of the same fraud of which he complains in the defendant. He certainly can have no claim to the extraordinary interposition of a tribunal constituted to administer equity, for the purpose of securing to him the profits arising from his fraudulent act. As to the notice of the entry as a copyright, the court said, apart from the fact that this is in such very small type, and so abbreviated that it would probably escape the observation of everyone whose attention was not specially directed to it, a circumstance which rather strengthens the evidence of an intention to mislead the public, what is there in the fact that the design or engraving had been copyrighted in the United States, inconsistent with the declaration that the cigars contained in the box were manufactured in Havana, of Cuban tobacco, but, again, it is said that the United States internal revenue stamp would at once undeceive the purchaser, there being a difference between the stamp used for articles imported and for those of domestic manufacture. Few persons would stop to notice this difference, and, besides, as it is alleged, the trademark is pasted on the inside of the lid, and when the box is open, for the purpose of retailing, the trademark is brought directly in the view of persons wishing to purchase and the revenue stamp is not seen unless the lid is turned down, and the box examined on the outside. It is contended further, that the falsehood is in a foreign language, of which it is to be presumed that the plaintiff's customers are ignorant. Yet there is certainly enough to convey to everyone who can read that the cigars are from, Havana. It is not necessary that any one person has been actually deceived or defrauded, it is enough that it is a misrepresentation calculated to have that effect on the unwary and unsuspicious. The decree refusing an injunction was affirmed, and the appeal dismissed at the costs of the appellant. Section 484. In Philon v. Wright, the plaintiff claimed to have compounded a new perfume, and to have invented a name for it, to wit, extract of night blooming cereus. He did not claim any exclusive right in the perfume itself. He had thus chosen the name of a rare, though well-known flower, and claimed in the name alone an exclusive right, as his trademark. He admitted that name to be a deception, so far as used to indicate the real character of the compound, and that the perfume was not an extract from the flower, the mark being in that respect a pure invention. As an exhibit, the plaintiff produced an advertising card, used to give publicity to his preparation, upon which card he declared that the new perfume is the extract of the night blooming cereus, distilled from this rare and beautiful flower, from which it takes its name. Thompson, J., said that this is a deception, intended to impose upon the public by exciting curiosity to learn the nature of the rare and beautiful flower. It may be that the deception is harmless. The manufactured perfume may be better than the genuine extract would be. But still it is a deception, and the plaintiff has no right to expect a court of equity to aid him in carrying it on. Dot.
thus the case stands upon the plaintiff's own showing. The defendants, by their affidavits, deny fully that the name upon their labels was used to imitate the plaintiff's labels, and they show, by the affidavit of the lithographer by whom the label was drawn and prepared, that he did not know of the existence of the plaintiff's label when he designed and drew that of the defendants. The labels are so little alike, and the name of the defendants so distinctly printed upon theirs, that, as has already been said, no one purchasing Wright's Night Blooming Sirius could suppose he was buying Philomnes. It is very manifest that the defendants did not sell their preparation as that of Philon's, and they clearly marked it as their own production. The motion for an injunction was dismissed. Section 485 In Hobbes v. Francais, the plaintiff moved for an injunction to restrain the defendant from violating his trademark. It appeared that he and another under the firm name of Fabian & Co., in 1846, commenced the manufacture and sale in the city of New York of a certain powder for beautifying the complexion and skin, that they had adopted as the name of the said article the words mean fun, and devised a label bearing that name, with certain devices upon it, to put upon the boxes and packages containing said article, and that they had sold said article by the name of mean fun, until 1848, when his partner, Fabian, transferred to the plaintiff his interest in business, and the right to use the firm name, label, devices, and marks. Further, that after the said article had acquired a reputation, and the sales had become large and profitable, the defendant had made and sold an article of skin, powder, put up in boxes like those of the plaintiff, and had placed on them labels closely imitating the plaintiff's with the words mean fun thereon. Section 486. The plaintiff's label read as follows, patronized by Her Majesty, the Queen. Mean fun, the celebrated Chinese skin powder for restoring, beautifying, and preserving the skin and complexion, preventing cutaneous eruptions, chapping, and obviating too copious perspiration. Adapted for all climates. Fabian and C.O. Sole Proprietors, 24 Mark Lane, London, and C. Section 487. Pickard, Bosworth, C. J. Colon The plaintiff's label is calculated to induce the belief, and probably was designed to induce the belief, that the article in the box on which it is pasted is manufactured in London, that the sole proprietors of it of their place of business at 24 Mark Lane, London, that it is intrinsically so excellent as to secure patronage of Her Majesty, the Queen, and that the labels have paid the stamp duty required by some English statute. The truth is, that it is made in New York, and that Her Majesty, the Queen, is probably ignorant of its virtues, or even of its existence. In this respect, there is a manifest intention to deceive and mislead the public. The plaintiff's label, instead of indicating that he is the manufacturer of the article covered by it, represents him to be the sole agent in the United States of the proprietors of it, and that their place of business is in London. It appears by the defendant's affidavit, that it is the prevailing belief in this country that ladies' toilet articles of English or French manufacture are superior to those made in this country, and that the demand for the former is much better than for the latter. The plaintiff's labels, therefore, contain representations believed to be useful, and which must be known to be false and to secure to the plaintiff by injunction an exclusive use of such a label, and the exclusive privilege of thereby deceiving the public, is an object to which a court of equity will not lend its aid. The court does not refuse its aid in such a case from any regard to the defendant, who is using the same efforts and misrepresentations to deceive the public, but on the principle that it will not interfere to protect a party in the use of trademarks which are employed to deceive the public and to deceive them by fraudulent representations contained in the labels and devices which are claimed to constitute only, or in part, such trademarks. On this ground, the motion for injunction must be denied. Section 488 Mr. Justice Jew replied this rule in Fetridge v. Wells, the Balm of Thousand Flowers case, dash that they who come into a court of equity seeking equity, must come with pure hands and a pure conscience. If they claim relief against the fraud of others, they must be free themselves from the imputation. The learned judge said, in ter alia, the position so strenuously insisted on, that the plaintiff's firm have an exclusive property in the words, balm of thousand flowers, 
or, which is the same thing, an exclusive right to use those words as a trademark, I wholly reject. Dot. It may be true that the defendants, if are permitted to use in their contemplated sales a trademark apparently the same as that of Fetteridge and Co., would commit a fraud upon the plaintiff and upon the public, but if the plaintiff and his firm are themselves engaged in the execution of a systematic plan for deceiving the public, if they have been, and are, endeavouring, constantly and daily, to multiply their sales, and swell their profits by false representations of the composition, qualities, and uses of the liquid compound which they invite the public to buy, it is strenuously insisted that a court of equity would violate its principles, and abuse its powers, by consenting to aid them, by an injunction or otherwise, in accomplishing their design, and to this proposition I yield my fullest assent. Dot. An exclusive privilege for deceiving the public is assuredly not one that a court of equity can be required to aid or sanction to do so, would be to forfeit its name and character. The injunction previously granted was therefore dissolved, but without costs, since, although the plaintiff might justly be required to pay costs, the defendants had certainly no title to receive them being equally guilty of wrong. Section 489 In Partridge v. Menck, in the Court of Appeals of New York, in 1848, this question received a full consideration. This case came before the Vice-Chancellor of the First Circuit on a motion founded on the bill and answer, to dissolve the preliminary injunction granted by an injunction master, on filing the bill. It appeared by the bill that one Golsh, who formerly resided in the city of New York, commenced the manufacture of a certain kind of friction matches, usually known as loco-foco matches, for which he acquired a great patronage. His matches were put up in small paper boxes, usually of brown paper, made with a cap or cover, which, when placed on the box, covered about a third of its length, and his trademark was a cut representing a straw beehive surrounded by flowers and foliage with the words a gold s friction matches above the hive the cut and the words were printed on a label which was pasted upon the front of each box the complainant succeeded golsh in his business and continued to manufacture and sell the same kind of matches using the same mark the label being sometimes varied his business had extended so that large quantities of his matches were exported to the west indies mexico and south america the bill charged that the defendants, Menk and Bax, had been and were engaged in manufacturing friction matches, purporting to be the Golsh matches. It set forth two labels as being used by the defendants upon the brown paper boxes in which they put up their matches. One contained the beehive and foliage, over which were printed the words Menk and Bax friction matches, late chemist to a Golsh, the words late chemist being in letters smaller than the rest and under the beehive were printed in two panels the number and street in which their manufactory was situated, and c. The other label was pretty much the same, the words a. Golsh being much larger and more prominent than those above them, it was charged that this was a piratical and fraudulent invasion of the complainant's trademark. The vice-chancellor said that, taking the whole label together as it appeared on a single box of matches when offered for sale, the resemblance of the beehive was qualified by the distinct terms, late chemist for a Golsh, so that the article did not purport to emanate from either Golsh or from his successor. He accordingly dissolved the injunction, placing his decision on the ground of dissimilarity in the labels of the respective parties. The complainant appealed to the Chancellor. He affirmed the decision, and upon the same grounds, not questioning the legal right of the complainant to use the mark set forth in his bill. The complainant thereupon appealed to the court of last resort. The court of appeals took a different view of the case, although the result was the same. Section 490. Pickard, Gardner, J. Colon If the statements of the bill are analyzed, it will be found that the complainant claims the exclusive right to impose upon the public matches made by himself as those manufactured by A. Golsh. He alleges that the label heretofore spoken of, which was used by said Golsh, had an imprint of a beehive, and the words, A. Golsh, friction matches, 124 12th Street, between 5th and 6th Avenues, New York, which label has been and now is used by your orator without variation. In every essential particular, as it respected the complainant, 
the statement of the label was false, the matches were not goal chess matches, in the sense in which it was intended that purchasers should understand those terms. He was in Europe, and had no interest or agency in their manufacture. Verbal declarations to a purchaser of the same kind, with a view to a sale of this article, it was conceded, would have been fraudulent. That they were made to assume a more permanent form, and one better calculated to impose upon those who relied upon the reputation, personal skill, and integrity of Golsh, can make no difference in the character of the transaction. It is no sufficient answer to this view of the subject that the complainant obtained from Golsh the secret of the manner in which his matches were prepared, or that he manufactured an article in all respects equal to that offered by the former proprietor. So, also, did the defendants, if we may trust their answer. Nor does it alter the case that the complainant purchased the right to use the name of A. Golsh. The privilege of deceiving the public, even for their own benefit, is not a legitimate subject of commerce, and at all events, if the maxim, that he who asks equity must come with pure hands, is not altogether obsolete, the complainant has no right to invoke the extraordinary jurisdiction of a court of chancery in favour of such a monopoly, the bill is therefore defective for want of equity, and for this reason, as well as for those as signed by the Vice-Chancellor and Chancellor, I think the order of the latter should be affirmed. Right, J, said, the label of the appellant is calculated to deceive the purchasers of matches, inducing all unacquainted with the agreement between him and Golsh to believe that they are purchasing an article manufactured and sold by Golsh himself, when, in truth, Golsh has no concern in the manufacture, nor interest in the business, and has left the country. The order was affirmed unanimously. Section 491. A court of equity will not interfere to protect the trademark of a quack medicine. In Fowl v. Spear, in the United States Circuit Court, E. D. of Pennsylvania, in 1817, the complainant applied for an injunction to restrain the defendant from using wrappers, labels, and bottles resembling those used by the complainant in his business of selling Wistar S. Balsam of Wild Cherry. Kane, J., refused the relief asked for. From his opinion, it appears that on one of the complainant's wrappers, which was made a part of the bill, the balsam was described as a valuable family medicine for consumption of the lungs, coughs, colds, asthmas, bronchitis, group, whooping cough, difficulty of breathing pains in the side or breast, liver complaints, and C, to which another paper, also among the exhibits, adds influenza, hoarseness, pains or soreness of the chest, and C. The judge said that it is not the office of chancery to intervene, by its summary process, in controversies like this, nom nostrum tenius componia. Looking at the incongruous group of diseases for which the balsa prescribes itself to public credulity, I must apply the principle of the Vice-Chancellor's decision in Pidding v. How, 8 Sim. 477, that a complainant whose business is imposition cannot invoke the aid of equity against a piracy of his trademark. The only remedy in such a case is at law. In 1855, the same judge made a similar ruling in the case of Heath v. Wright, where the complainant sought to restrain the defendant from using the word cation of assumed prodigious efficacy in many diseases. Section 492. A mere false or exaggerated statement in a public advertisement will not deprive the owner of his right to protection. In Curtis v. Bryan, the defendant interposed the objection that the plaintiff's medicine was not what by the advertisement it purported to be, and that it was not perfectly safe or harmless, but that, on the other hand, it contained ingredients which are injurious and baneful to children. The court said that it is difficult to conceive upon what principle of equity this defendant should be heard to raise this objection. His own conduct in regard to the subject matter is an unequivocal concession to the goodness and value of the plaintiff's article. He interposes this objection to avoid an injunction which restrains him from imitating the plaintiff's article. After the plaintiff's preparation had been in use for nearly twenty, five years, its sale having steadily increased during all that time, the defendant appears, and places upon the market an article which, by the practices and arts to which he has had recourse, he would have the public purchase as the plaintiff's article. If the article was not a good one, why should the defendant imitate it? If it was injurious to health, 
it is not reasonable to suppose that a prudent man would venture to introduce a similar article under the same name, and hope to succeed. Dot. Experience is an excellent teacher, and the fair trial of an article will furnish unerring evidence of its worthlessness or value. It is obviously true that if a medicine can stand the test of twenty years of experimental use, and grow steadily and constantly in favor, its properties cannot be injurious. But, as before observed, the good faith of this defendant, in raising the objection, may reasonably be questioned, and I am satisfied that it does not lie in his mouth to make it. If a man's acts are any indication of his belief, on any subject, the conduct and admissions of the defendant constitute a complete refutation to this objection. A man's faith is shown by his works. The defendant was accordingly restrained, with costs. Section 493. In Smith v. Woodruffy the doctrine of estoppel was also applied, admitting, for the sake of argument, that the plaintiff's preparation was a fraud upon the public, the court said that that suggestion comes with a poor grace from one who has, by the imitation, been guilty of the same fraud upon the public, if such it happens to be. This case was an appeal from an order dissolving an injunction restraining the defendant from manufacturing and selling a perfume called Sweet Opipanax of Mexico, from selling any perfumery with that name, from using the name in connection with any perfumery, from using the plaintiff's label, or any imitation or counterfeit thereof, and from using the label then employed by the defendant, as set out in the complaint. From the opinion of the court, in reversing the order above mentioned, we learn that the plaintiffs, in connection with their label, put forth a puff, stating that the Opipanax is a native flower from Mexico, of rare and very rich fragrance, from which this extract is distilled, and see, on the part of the defendant, several perfumers made affidavit that they had examined the perfume of the plaintiffs, that they could tell, approximately, its ingredients, that it was not distilled from the flower of Opipanax, but was a compound of several well-known tinctures or essential oils, combined with pure spirits. Others stated that there was a resinous gum in the market, of a disagreeable odor, but no flowers of Opipanax. The plaintiffs, and their chemists, swore that the said Opipanax was used in the preparation, distillation, and manufacture of said perfume, and that the perfume was made from it. Several perfumers also made affidavits that it was not possible for any perfumer to tell the ingredients of the plaintiff's perfume. Under this contradictory state of evidence, the rule was not available to the defendant. The injunction was restored with costs from defendant. Section 194. Fictitious name of manufacturer. The fact that a trademark bears a fictitious name as the name of the manufacturer does not affect the owner's right to protection, where it is shown that it is not used with any fraudulent intent, and does not in fact deceive the public. This point is illustrated by the case of Dale v. Smithson, where Thomas Nelson Dale was adjudged to have a lawful right to the exclusive use of the following, Cauteria Flax, Thomas Nelson and Company, warranted fast colors and 16 ounces the defendants, who had closely imitated the plaintiff's label, which strictly speaking is not a trademark, contended that the plaintiffs could not acquire an exclusive right to the use of said label, because it did not indicate the true origin or ownership of the thread to which it was affixed, the name of Thomas Nelson and company being that of a fictitious firm, and that as the plaintiffs were thus practicing a deception upon the public by passing off the thread as being manufactured by persons who had no real existence, and court of equity should not interfere to protect them in their fraud. Section 495 The court, by Hilton, J., said in reply, that the label is manifestly one not intended to delude the public, by making any representations or asserting anything in respect to its qualities or properties, which are untrue, therefore, it cannot be said that. In protecting the plaintiffs in its use, we are assisting in the perpetration of a fraud. It is not contended that the thread to which this label is affixed is an article without merit, while, on the contrary, the testimony at the trial fully established the fact that by its excellence it had acquired a valuable celebrity among dealers, and, besides, has become well known as the thread of the plaintiffs. The use of the name was not with any fraudulent intent, but, as is stated by Mr. Dale, it arose from the fact that this Christian name is Thomas Nelson, and it is quite obvious that it was used for purposes of identification, 
and with about the same object as if, instead, he had adopted some familiar emblem, figure, or picture, by which the thread might be designated, and become generally known in the market. The public is not in fact deceived, as it is shown that no such firm exists as Thomas Nelson and Co., who are known to be manufacturers of thread, and the label does not pretend to hold out that any particular manner of manufacturing the thread is followed by which this pretended firm are enabled to furnish a better quality than anyone else. Apart from the use of this fictitious firm name, it is not claimed that the label is false in any other respect, and, under the circumstances shown in this case, I think it would be a gross injustice to deny the plaintiff's protection in the use of a trademark to which their title has been so clearly established. This is the doctrine held by the court in Stuart v. Smithson, in the New York Common Pleas Court, in Bank. After issue joined, the defendants moved to amend their answer by adding the following allegations, and the defendants, on information and belief, state that the mark claimed by the plaintiffs and set out in the third section of the complaint, viz, Hall and Moody's patent thread, Barnsley, was and is a false and fraudulent mark, used by the plaintiffs to deceive and defraud, and that the thread containing said mark, sold or kept for sale by the plaintiffs, was not and is not patent, and that no patent for said thread has ever existed, nor was said thread manufactured by Hall and Moody, nor by any person or persons their assignees or successors nor was said thread manufactured at, or brought from, Barnsley, all which the plaintiffs well knew. There was also another proposed amendment, involving the same point. The motion was denied, upon the ground that the proposed amendments contained no defense. The defendants appealed. The court, by Brady, J., said that the mere fact that names used on a trademark are fictitious would not authorize the use of it by strangers. The question to be determined in these cases is, whether the mark used by the party claiming the protection of the court is owned by him, without regard to its form, which such party has a right to design according to his judgment or his fancy. If the defendants had alleged that the firm names used on the marks never existed, that would, for the reason stated, furnish no justification for their use of it, and it would not have presented a defense in this action. They have not done so. However, nor have they alleged that firms whose names do appear on the mark did exist, and that the use of their names by the plaintiffs was wholly unauthorized. If they had alleged this, then, in the application of the maxim, potiorist conditio defendentis, the courts might relieve them from any disturbance by the plaintiffs. Section 496. No defense that spurious article is equal to genuine. It is no defense to a suit for assuming a trademark that the simulated article is equal in quality to the genuine. Upon this point the following distinctions are made. If a druggist prepare a certain kind of medicine, and designate it by the name of a superior medicine, invented, prepared, and sold by the plaintiff, and sells it as and for the medicine prepared by the plaintiff, the plaintiff may maintain an action against him, without proof of special damage. But where certain medicines are designated by the name of the inventor, as a generic term, descriptive of a kind or class, the inventor is not entitled to the exclusive right of compounding or vending them, unless he have obtained a patent therefore, and if another person prepare such medicines of an inferior quality, and by this means all medicines of this class be brought into disrepute, such inventor can maintain no action for any loss sustained by him in consequence thereof, unless they are sold as and for medicines prepared by him. Moreover, it is no defense that the marks of the spurious goods, or the jobber who sells them to the retailers, inform those who purchase that the article is spurious or an imitation. Section 497. Lackeys. So if a plaintiff lie by for a long time before filing his bill for an injunction, the while being aware of the encroachment, that exhibition of lackeys will be deemed equivalent to a want of good faith. The case of Beard v. Turner, before Vice-Chancellor Wood, in 1866, affords such an instance. There, it seems, the plaintiff for two years before filing his bill saw done the identical thing of which he complained. The court said, but suppose you wish to profit by the act of which you say you have a right to complain, and shall at some future period complain of, then I apprehend this court will say, you must come here at once, for this reason, 
that you ask in your bill for an account of the profits made by this gentleman upon the sale of these goods. The plaintiff may say, it may answer my purpose to let the defendant go on selling four or five years, and then at the end of that time to say he is my salesman, and I come for an account of profits. I know of no instance in which the court has given relief with reference to a trademark except on a prompt application. By not complaining at the time when you might complain, I do not say that it is your intention, we must judge of the intention by the necessary result, you are lying by. The man continuing to use your property, with the hope, and such is the prayer in your bill filed two or three years afterward, of obtaining those profits which you stood by allowing him to make under this designation, without apprising him of your intention to make any such use of it. On that ground it falls within the principle enunciated. Dot in which it is stated that it is a fraud to allow a plaintiff to avail himself of delay to obtain benefit for himself. In that case you will not grant him relief, you will assume, when he allows another wrongfully to use that which, in the plaintiff's judgment, would facilitate a rival in trade, that being so, unless you come quickly, you must make a rival in trade your agent, for the purpose of carrying on that business, and for the purpose of getting an account at the end of four years. Dot. It appears to me, therefore, that if I had come to a different conclusion, it might have affected the question of costs, although it would not have affected the question of relief. I could not give a person an opportunity of lying by, and then asking for an account of the profits made by an injury committed. In Harrison v. Taylor, in 1865, the Vice-Chancellor refused an account of profits, on the ground of the plaintiff's delay before commencing suit. Although the defendant bad persevered in the use of the mark after having been cautioned in the Amuskig Manufacturing Co. v. Gunner, before Barnard, J., at special term, in 1869, a delay of nine years in applying for an injunction to restrain the violation of a trademark, was held good cause for refusing relief. The plaintiff alleged that the defendants wrongfully used a trademark belonging to the plaintiff and used to stamp cotton clothes. The judge said that the plaintiff had by silence consented to, is it did not encourage, the defendants in the use of the mark in question upon their labels, introducing these prints to the trade generally throughout the country. That, under these circumstances, to deprive the defendants of the use of these labels would work to them great and irreparable injury, wrong, and hardship, and at the same time give to the plaintiff a dishonest and unconscientious advantage as the fruits of the plaintiff's own wrong and negligence. The rule is that the plaintiff must not be guilty of any improper delay in applying for relief. He said, further, that the design and object of the plaintiff in enjoining the defendants, at that particular time, from using the said labels, was to produce financial embarrassment by destroying their profitable trade, immediately after the payment by the leading member of the defendant's firm, in pursuance of the terms of his father's will, of the sum of three dollars, two hundred and twenty-five, oh oh oh, that to uphold the injunction upon the papers before him would be grossly inequitable and unjust to the defendants, would enable the plaintiff to profit largely by its own wrong and negligence and thus turn the court into an engine to oppress and destroy, when its true office is to relieve a party from hardship and oppression, and to protect him in the enjoyment of his rights, when they are illegally and wrongfully invaded, or threatened with injury. Injunction dissolved, with costs. Section 498. What not deemed lack is, when a trader believes that he has good ground for complaining of a colorable imitation of the style of his business, he is justified in waiting until he can collect a sufficient number of cases to show that the alleged attempt has succeeded, before he file his bill, inasmuch as it would not be safe for him to come into court until he could establish actual cases of deception. This the case of the Guinea Colco, in 1869.